everyone. I'm Chingy Fong, the coordinator for the Center for Complex Systems. And so I was really happy that uh, this is the first uh, first meeting of this academic year. And of course, we're having events before, but it's, uh, it's kind of unusual because most of people know that we usually have a lunch meetings. But today, because uh, we are going to introduce a new technique and also start holding this area that's called the neural differential, uh, differential equations. So that's why we invited the really expert on the field and, uh, and Patrick, but he's located in California. When we come to, to ask him whether I could give a long talk, he said, the, uh, the earliest I can do is uh, eight o'clock in the morning here. So that's the five o'clock here in the afternoon. So I thought, oh, why not make a party with the pizza and pasta? And so I think that works. So, so, uh, I try to see a lot of people here, not just you know, stay online waiting for the dinner. So yeah, we're very happy that you are you are here, and uh, I think that now we give fifteen minutes to for Patrick to brush his teeth or whatever. <laughs> and so uh, we have a uh, Han Daksha, that's our director, to fill the gap and uh, to also fill the gap uh, between the knowledge that's the what's the, the connections to with the, the machine learning of this new technique. So now, Lois, you to fill in the time. <laughs> 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 No, I, I think the idea is if we, if we organize it at five o'clock, nobody will come. So I thought, well, we'll do a short introduction, <laughs> five, and you know, maybe that helps. And I'm glad you're all here. But it it's seems that just you're, oh, good. So that you're interested in the subject. Now, I have no clue, you know, what your background is, and maybe some of you have never heard of machine learning. Some of you are you not know, so familiar with complex systems either. So I, I thought, how, how do I put, you know, this neural differential equations in the, in the context? Um, how you in the machine learning and complex systems. So that's my attempt, uh, how to do that. So uh, let you see, you know, the standard uh, multi-layer perceptron, so it's a, a, a typical neural network. To the right, you see a typical complex system, like a flocking of birds, right? So you have individual birds, they interact, and they give eventually, through the interaction, they give you this sort of nice microscopic patterns. And so the question is, how can we use machine learning into complex systems, say, uh, modeling and complex systems analysis. Now, first about machine learning, for, for those you know who are not so familiar with that, you all know linear regression. Right? You just have a set of points uh, where X is your feature or your your coordinate and Y is your the outcome, so that's your label in machine learning term. And then what you do, you fit you know, a, a line through the point and you try to Sort of minimize the errors since the end you turn an A and B. So that's the, the simplest sort of uh, technique to fit uh, in this case a line to a set of points. And the loss function here is typically your sort of square error or even square error. Now, if you extend that a little bit uh, to what is called logistic regression, you have also your features here would be x1 to xm, and usually include a bias. And then what you, you what you have certain weights, and then you take a linear sort of uh, sum of your product of uh, the weights times the, the features to so the sum of you know, w i x i where x zero is one, and then what you do you you get a you put a nonlinear feature in there on this nonlinear function of this result. And then what you do, you minimize the error between what comes out there and your labels, so that's your values of y. And then what you can do, you minimize for the weights. And then what you get out, you can actually use maybe in a quantizer to do the classification. And typically what is used is sort of like a sigmoid function as a nonlinearity, but there are many more. There are all kinds of nonlinearities you can add to this relationship. So what you do basically, is to extend this linear regression, you extend to nonlinear sort of relationships between the features and the labels. This is what you do. And, and in a multi-layer perceptron, what you do, you have all kinds of layers. And so this is the layers where you basically do the same procedure, but you go from each layer, you see they're all connected, and you can make much more complicated nonlinear relationships between the, uh, say, features and the labels. So that's in a very simple nutshell uh, what this type of machine learning does with neural networks. So if you look at, uh, at the field of machine learning, of course, that's much broader. What we now looked at 
this is neural network is, is a, a typically case of supervised learning because you know the features and you have with the features you have data on the labels so that basically gives you some kind of supervision but there's all kind of other techniques where you have maybe no you have a lot of data but you don't know the, the labels with you know the features and so you can also do all kind of machine learning techniques to sort of cluster the data or do something else in dimensionality reduction. But this is the, the sort of classification and regression are sort of the main, let's say, procedures where supervised learning is used. And uh, then you have a, a reinforcement learning where you, you know, you, you correct the system for certain responses. Uh, but let's, let's focus on the supervised learning because this is also where basically much of the neural differential equation that we can discuss falls into. And uh, in, in the climate field, but this is not general, I realize that, this is in the climate field where I'm in, we have made a distinction between what is called soft machine learning, uh, hard machine learning, and medium machine learning. This is not general, I, I realize that. But for us, it makes the life a bit easier to think about these uh, different techniques so what we what we think as soft machine learning is just making you know some task more efficient. You don't add anything to say uh, more. You try to represent more physics, or you basically want to extract anything out of data for which you don't want to use a model. You just have a more efficient operation on the thing you were already doing, which was very computation intensive. So here, for instance, this is an old paper in 1998. This is the, the low hanging fruit already uh, in that where they use a neural network to look at, you know, just as uh, sort of uh, replace a long wave radiation budget scheme for the Earth, which is very complicated to really compute. And they just sort of fit a neural network to get and use that in the model. So this is sort of what we call the soft way, because it's only making things more efficient. Yeah. Well, then you can, uh, I mean, there's some, some benefits, you know, it's just a performance, basically. It's easier to include some of the physical constraints you always want to, you want to have conservation properties. And uh, of course, you don't gain any new understanding of, of the phenomena because you just you know, replace it. So very expensive scheme with a very efficient scheme. Now you can imagine at the other end, and this is where you're probably most familiar with, is the hard machine learning, where you, you throw away every equation you have. So you don't worry about any conservation of you know, properties of a certain uh, model. And you just uh, try to find relationships between, say, features and labels uh, just from the data. And uh, so that's why it's called hard, because you, you, you basically throw away any of the equations. So you have no uh, physical information anymore. And uh, well, there's many examples where it outperforms traditional models. I mean, I, I just cannot show those, but there are many examples of that. And you can sometimes gain new understanding. There are a lot of uh, explainable AI techniques in this realm where you can actually <laughs> look backwards and see what type of features will give you most of the information on the labels. And that will give you, in many cases, there's quite you know, some physical expectation with that. Now, there's all kinds of uh, say, challenges. Uh, uh, you need sufficient data. This is uh, the training data. This is, uh, of course, you have to train those weights, right? You see a typical problem, which I, I gave to the students during the course in machine learning and, and, and physics climate, where they look at sea surface temperature patterns. They do a uh, multi layer perceptron here. And what they do is they have to classify whether it's an El Nino or La Nina. Right? This is a typical problem. And so they train the network and then they have test data. And then you can see you know, whether the testing was okay in the neural network, yeah? whether it generalizes. Now, of course, extrapolation is always a different thing because you, if you don't have phenomena in the training data, which are sort of in the test data, then it will not perform well. So there's always a problem with all the machine learning codes. But this is the sort of hard ML way. Now, there's, there's a, you can imagine the medium. AI. And I first let me show you a, a hard ML, say, uh, ex, uh, sort of application in complex systems. So, the, 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 
Okay, switch the button. Switch the button. Yeah. Well, otherwise, you know, don't worry. Yeah. 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 And usually what they do, they assume the rules. So they, for instance, this is the, the old paper by uh, Reynolds in computer graphics, where they say, you know, you have three rules. There's position avoidance, there's velocity matching, and there's flock centering. If you put that into a, a model, like in, even in that logo, a very simple, say, complex systems configuration, you'll find that, you know, you'll find this flocking type of behavior. Really fantastic how, how that arises, how that emerges out of the rules. But of course, we don't know whether the birds do this. Maybe the interaction is much more complicated. So then the machine learning comes in, as the music stops, luckily. So here's a recent paper by a Korean group. And I won't explain you exactly what they're doing in terms of machine learning, but what they, the intention you see, they have data from birds. This is really nice, uh, very detailed data on how birds, say, start flying and how they actually behave. And then uh, what they do, they fit to, you know, the, see the positions and the velocities here as, as, as uh, features. They basically fit a time evolution operator, which looks very complicated. It's agent net. You can look it up. It's on GitHub also. And they, they use uh, encoded, decoded, and, and all kind of, uh, say, uh, difficult. This is a multi-layer perceptron. You see, it's all kind of, you know, difficult constructions in the machine, right? It doesn't matter now. But what they do is they basically fit an evolution operator where they construct the time evolution and how the birds go from time t to time t plus one, just by the data. So this is the hard machine learning way. And what they do, what they find in these results, now here's a, there's a lot of different techniques, of course, which you can use with the agent net here. This is the error in the displacement error, the test results. So the reason, look at how, how close you can so mimic the flight of these birds. And this, this agent net is really doing much better than many of the other type of uh, techniques which you can use to simulate this type of flocking. And the interesting thing is they can, from that machine, they can actually look at, for instance, what is the attention of the birds? So where are they looking at in the interaction? And here they, you see they're looking forward, but they're looking also downward. And this is somehow it comes out of the data from the machine. And it seems, you know, if you look at if they, they claim to the biologists that they actually this is their attention span in looking, interacting with other birds. So the idea is that the machines, they can actually extract a lot of information on the interactions between all humans. And this is crucial in complex systems. So this is this is nice, and uh, but this is still the hard way. Now you can imagine that the medium machine learning is somewhere in between. You still want to use equations for conservation properties, but everything you cannot capture with that, you want to use a machine to do that. This is the, the key here. And a, a typical example, in, uh, this is from uh, my field, from ocean mixing, where you basically you, you don't know how the equivalent eddies in the ocean, how they produce transport of particular quantities like heat and salt, but what you can do is that you can actually, from the data, you can construct, say, uh, equations, basically, which mimic these processes. And you can actually derive a set of equations based on the data used by a machine. And, uh, well, of course, uh, you'd have to show that it outperforms uh, traditional models, which it does in many cases. You can include very easily uh, physical constraints because you still have the equations. It's just a detail which you sort of want to capture. And uh, well, the other things are still, of course, uh, similar true for the medium AI than or medium machine learning than the uh, hard machine learning. Now, is an example. And this is, comes in then to the neural differential equations. This is a recent uh, sort of manuscript submitted. Where they do a very simple problem. 
they cool a layer of fluid from below, from above. And what it does is the temperature fields uh, in the beginning, and then uh, this is the deviation after a while. So the, the snapshot, you see, you get these really turbulent motions in the upper left layer. And now what you want to know, you want to sort of create a net transport, right? So the net vertical mixing. This is a very difficult problem to really do that by physics parameterization. But there are, you know, there's a whole school of parameterizations. So relationships from experiments, from theoretical considerations. And so basically what you want is something like this. You want to have the time derivative of the temperature in the, say, at the position here in the fluid. And you want to write it as a divergent of some kind of flux. And what they do, you have a parameterized flux. So that's something that comes from theory or from semi sort of empirical work. And then what you do now is say, okay, I, I cannot capture everything with that. So I, I assume there's something missing. Okay? And now what you do is you, you take this missing part here and you try to model that with a neural network. This is the idea behind it. And then it's nearly five o'clock, so I'm actually doing five. And then you come into this realm, what is called, you know, this neural differential equations, where you have just to have a set of equations. But in your right hand side, it's just if theta could be a contribution from just deterministic equations or stochastic equations, but you add a part which is the new ODE, which basically captures the missing part, right? Which you I find difficult to represent, which is in the data, but you cannot capture it very easily. And so here comes uh, uh, our expert in, which I hope is this online. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let me introduce him very quickly, and then he uh, he can have the, the of course he's the expert, so he can talk, tell about it. Uh, so he got his PhD, and as you can see, in uh, 2021 in uh, in Oxford University of Oxford. And on the web, he says he's a mathematician, he's a machine learner, and a serial hobbyist. So the, he works now at the Google X in California with Alphabet, and uh, we're happy to uh, to have him here and. Uh, I would say, Patrick, uh, take the floor. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation. Um, can I just quickly double check that you can all hear me correctly? Can, can you hear me? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just oh, yeah, I'll put the sound up because uh, mm -hmm. Andy doesn't like the YouTube video, but now we like uh, you speaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, whilst oh, you sort that okay. out, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, please share your screens. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so in that case, just to double check, you can both hear me and see my screen, question mark? Yes, you can see my screen. Okay, so hello everyone, it's great to be here. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And indeed, as has been suggested, I'm gonna say, uh, you know, give you a bit of an introduction to the topic of neural ODEs. Um, and this is very much going to be leaving, uh, picking up from the previous talk, um, uh, where Hank's talking about how you can like start adding like neural network correction terms to start modeling the bits you don't understand. And that's really going to be the dominant theme in, in what I'm talking about going forward. Um, and, and for my part, neural differential equations are topics very close to my heart because it's actually what I do day in, day out, um, modeling some problems in computational biology. Um, and so a lot of what I do is, is not just that, but also I'll speak a little bit towards the end about some of the software that we have um, for working with these things in practice, because at the end of the day, you know, someone, typically a grad student, needs to sit down and actually implement these things um, and pass the kind of software that's necessary to make this happen. Um, so I'll ho hope to touch on both a little bit of both theory and practice. Okay, with that, let's get going. Um, I, I understand that uh, the audience is sort of mixed audience of academics from various backgrounds. So I'm not going to be assuming that much machine learning knowledge. And I'm going to try and build this up from traditional um, approaches to modeling that probably many of you have already seen. Um, so first of all, as I probably don't need to tell anyone, right? Differential equations are really, really good models. They've been the dominant modeling paradigm for like three centuries now. Um, and, you know, obviously these are great for modeling, you know, look out in the world, every kind of like physics and biology and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, here's, a, here's my, my nice little toy example that we're going to keep coming back to throughout the, the rest of my talk. Um, so uh, these are these are very famous. These are the logical Volterra, Fredo to Frey equations. Um, and so if you've not seen these before, this is a, a very standard off the shelf sort of theoretical model describing the relationship between uh, a predator species here, here denoted by the cats and a prey species denoted by the rabbits. Um, and so you can see things like, you know, d rabbit dt equals is proportional to the number of rabbits. Uh, and so, you know, rabbits begetting more rabbits, but in turn, you see this term, term in the top right is telling you that rabbits get eaten by cats. 
Um, and so you sort of expect there to be some sort of dynamics between, between these two. Um, and in all cases, a differential equation has got this really simple idea, right? We just write down how our value starts, how it changes over time. And then after that, typically I go ahead and I plug it into some numerical ODE solver and then, you know, bada bing, bada boom, here's my solution. Um, sort of just quick side note as well. I did emphasize numerical um, solver there. Um, people who are especially coming out of academic backgrounds sometimes think as well about like seeking analytical solutions. Um, this is true certainly for very, very simple ODEs, but it's like almost never possible for anything you ever work with in practice. Um, so I'm basically not gonna talk about that. And the emphasis is very much going to be on the on numerics whenever you want a, whenever you want a solution. Okay, great. So I've I've written down my my equations describing how I think per term uh, play interact. Um, but then, unfortunately, I looked out at the world and I gathered some data, and and the world had uh, you know the, the the misfortune to go and give me something else. Right, my my data has not matched my model. And why is that? Well, you know, it's it's this model up here. Um, it's unparameterized. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'll add in some parameters, and then I'm going to try and change these parameters to try and fit my data. Right? And so again, I'm expecting this is probably pretty standard, right? So what do I do is I, I just initialize my parameters. I set up some loss function saying, how good is my model with respect to my data? Um, and then I use the machine learning word back propagate through the differential equation solver. Uh, if you're coming out of like other parts of science, you might just say sensitivity analysis. It's the same thing. It's, it's you know, this has been happening in science for like decades before the machine learning folks got their hands on it. Um, and then you just train by a gradient descent. So you keep walking downhill so that this loss function gets smaller and your model keeps getting closer and closer to your data. So let's suppose I do that. Um, and then you can see we've just done that little walk downhill and uh, I've now fit these parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, so that my model is now fit to my data. So first of all, hurrah, this thing looks a lot better than this thing I just kind of randomly wrote down to begin with. Um, but noticeably, it's still wrong in a great many places. Um, you know, you can clearly see, you know, th these, these lines and, the, and these, uh, the data points, the dots, do not perfectly overlap. Um, so this is where your ODEs really start to enter the picture. And again, this is why I'm starting to dovetail with the previous talk. Um, so let's suppose, for example, that I might, might, I might do this. I might, I might look at this result and I might suspect for whatever reason that it is the, the rate of change of rabbits that is the bit that is not being well modeled. Let's, let's make that assumption. So I, I throw in a little neural network there. And at this point, what I'm doing basically is I'm saying, please neural network, just model the residual, model the bit that I don't already understand um, uh, through this like theoretical approach. And so doing so um, is, uh, like, A, first of all, just a, an admission that there are things we do not know, right? This is an admission that there is behavior, there is phenomena that I have no theory for, and I just don't know what it is. And I'm going to have the neural network just sort of paper up the gaps for me. Um, and uh, when, I, when I go ahead and run this, so what, what do I do? Well, actually, I'm going to go and do basically the exact same thing, right? So I, I say uh, theta, so in this case, theta sampled from some normal distribution. So this is, this is some vector of parameters inside my neural network. I'm going to go ahead and sample this, uh, and then I'm going to do the exact same thing I did before, which is where I just go ahead and I initialize, and I set up a loss function, I backpropagate, it, and I train via gradient descent. So let's suppose I do that, and ta-da! I've now got a much better model, in fact. If you, if you sort of keep that previous one in your head, you, could, you might have noticed, in fact, if I go back, you notice how all the peaks here are the same height, for example, in my model. These, this orange curves are the same height, the, these blue curves all peak at the same height. Um, that, that was a, you know, a, how my theoretical model was set up. But if I, my, my neural network model, as you can see, it's just starting to, to better fit the data a little bit because it has this extra flexibility to, to capture these extra more complicated dynamics, which you, which you can see seem to be exhibiting some kind of decaying behavior. Um, now, at this point, obviously, I've just sort of said neural network and just kind of like not told you anything more about it, right? I sort of uh, just said, oh, it's a neural network. But what kind of neural network, right? There's like, you know, hundreds of different kinds of neural networks out there. Um, and the the simple answer for this is just simply a feed-forward neural network. Um, any of you who've done even a little bit of machine learning will, will have seen this before. It's like your very first neural network that you ever see. Um, and it's that one that you have, where you have a picture in your head, right? like a bunch of dots connected by lines, right? Like it's that. Um, it's, uh, it turns out actually that this very simple thing is indeed the thing that we do a lot of the time in practice. Um, uh, this turns out to be actually really, really hard to beat. Um, and so, so this is the sort of like the, the simple setup for, for how I might start using neural ODEs. However, having told you all of that, right, there's still all kinds of places where my model does not agree with my data. Um, the, the neural ODE is not perfect. There's, there's still quite a lot that, that it, it can't capture, that it isn't capturing at any rate. Um, and so I've, I've highlighted some, some obvious discrepancies some, uh, here. So, okay, um, back to the drawing board then. 
what else might I consider doing? Um, and there was one really arbitrary choice that I made early on. And our arbitrary choice was the fact that I'm going to put my neural network here, up in the top right, which is going to affect this D rabbits DT. Um, I could put my neural network somewhere else. I could have it try to model some other kind of error. I could posit that my, my problematic term is elsewhere. So maybe I do something like, say, this. Um, and so, so once again, recall that we've got this theta, this is this vector of parameters inside my neural network, describing all these like, weights and biases hidden inside. I've packaged them all up into this theta. I've got my neural network, which is going to be a function of rabbits and cats. And now it's going to be uh, producing a correction term to the, the cats in this one term down here in the bottom right. Um, so that's that's my um, this is my, my 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 second guess for how I might try and fix things up. Um, so in this case, we've now I've now reset things back in, in this picture. This is now the theoretical model once again, and now we're, once again we're going to start training from this as a baseline. We're going to start training from this and, and see can we get a better model. So take two, and I've run, now run this again. Um, and so once again, what have I done? I've initialized all these parameters. I've set up this loss function describing this this discrepancy between my data and my model. I've uh, computed some gradients. I've, I've just kept walking downhill, kept adjusting these parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, theta. Uh, I kept adjusting these parameters so that, so that this, this loss function gets smaller and I get agreement between data and model. Um, and then eventually uh, this, this loss function plateaus and, and I can't get any better. And, and now my model hopefully looks a lot like my data. And in this particular case, yes. Yes, it does. And so actually, um, it's still not perfect, right? There are still things here where I'm not getting absolutely everything, um, but nonetheless, it's gotten a lot better than both of my previous two attempts. Um, so, OK, that's rather a lot of words. Let's sort of just quickly pause and sort of take stock uh, a moment. What, what have we seen? Um, first of all, I started this off by talking about parameterized differential equations. Uh, and I, I wrote down this very simple looking theoretical thing um, that sort of seemed almost toy, right? With just the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and nothing else. Um, and then I said, okay, I'm going to like initialize these parameters. I'm going to set up my loss function, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to train this thing. Um, and then the, the really cool bit, I think, is that when I added this neural network, that story did not change, right? I've added in a neural network and I've now I've gone ahead um, and used the exact same training procedure as I was always using. And as indeed people have been using for like, you know, decades to fit these models. Um, the... Uh, this is something where I, I like to emphasize this because people often have this picture in their heads that there's like neural networks, that's one thing, and differential equations, that's another thing. And that these are somehow these like two separate modeling paradigms. Um, but the moral of the story here really is that these are actually two very, very tightly linked modeling paradigms. Um, a neural network, it's some differentiable computation graph, right? Some graph of operations, you know, I do a bunch of additions and multiplications and whatnot inside internally. I get this computation graph, I differentiate through it, that's the back propagation, that's how I get my gradients. In the case of an ODE, once again, the internals of my ODE solver define a computation graph. The internals of my ODE solver plus this vector field define a bunch of additions and multiplications and whatnot. And this collectively, when I run the solver, builds up a big computation graph. And then I can differentiate through that. That's what I was doing way back when, before I even introduced a neural network. Um, and so we see that kind of like this, this notion of like just auto differentiable computation graph is really uh, as specific as you ever need to think about things. Um, and everything is basically just about trying to build a smart computation graph that somehow describes your data. Um, and, th and then to, to, of course, to use that as your model. Um, so yeah, first of all, these, these things are, are really, really tightly linked. Um, one detail that I have papered over here and I, I've told you very little about is this uh, backpropagate through the ODE solver. I didn't, I just sort of just said, oh, we're just gonna, you know, just gonna compute gradients, right? Um, and then you sort of accept that I'm just doing sort of computing some derivative D loss, this, this data minus model, that I'm doing this D loss D parameters of the beta, gamma, delta, and possibly theta. Um, how have I actually gone ahead and computed that? So this is something where the, the this field, I guess you might call it like auto differentiable simulation or something like that. Um, this has come a long way in the past 10 years. Um, this is something where like you want to go back to like the bad old days and you've got a lot of people sort of like writing out their derivatives by hand or they've got like some sort of like C++ or Fortran wrapper to try and compute derivatives through their code. Um, and, and the whole thing frankly gets quite complicated and frankly quite buggy as well. Um, and and really, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do to do things like differentiate through your ODE solver. Um, where once again, recall what I'm saying is differentiate through the internal operations, all those additions and multiplications and whatnot. 
Um, and so this is something where, as I start moving towards the second half of my talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the software. Um, and sort of the dominant theme here really has been that machine learning happened. Machine learning happened and they needed to do lots and lots of backpropagation and lots and lots of auto differentiation. So they went ahead and wrote out some really cool software to make this possible. So frameworks like PyTorch and Jax that you've probably heard of before. Um, uh, TensorFlow, of course, is, is, is well, sort of like the, the going back a few years now. Um, and, and so the the way they were able to do this backpropagate through the ODE solver, and the thing I'm going to be speaking about in about five slides time, is going to be um, uh, the fact that we write out our differential equation solvers in these machine learning frameworks, and we just repurpose them from machine learning to scientific modeling. Because, as I've been saying, it's the same thing. It's all just auto-differentiable computation graphs. OK, that's a lot of words on this slide, so um, let's move on. So tricks of the trade. I have told you, you know, this very simple uh, picture of, oh, I just add in my neural network and then I just train it and it just works, right? Um, and well, actually, you know, there's still things you need to do. Um, uh, anyone who's ever worked with any kinds of machine learning uh, tools before knows that like, you know, you just, you just try this thing and maybe it works first time, but maybe it doesn't and now you're left trying to debug this. So, okay, what are the common things to, to go and look for? Um, this, is, this is an interesting one. Um, I, I've given you this long time series, this long oscillatory time series. Um, in this case, it, it's, uh, it wasn't too bad, but it's also quite common if you have an oscillatory time series, you fit your data, uh, fit your model to this data, and it just kind of like fails entirely. It gets trapped in a bad local minima. Um, and so a very common trick is to train on just the first few time points of your time series, then train on some longer time points, then train on some even longer time points, sort of dot, dot, dot. Um, and basically what you're doing is you're first of all trying to fit your model to a very simple um, window of, of your data, so a very simple part of your data, then to a slightly more complicated part of your data, then to a slightly more complicated part of your data again, dot, 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 right, as you keep getting longer, longer time series. So this is a really, really important technique for, for avoiding these bad local minima, um, which you'll see a lot of, by the way, um, when fitting classical mechanistic models. Classical mechanistic models typically have these horrendous loss landscapes when you try to fit them directly to data. Um, and actually, this is one of the sort of the, the unspoken advantages of neural ODEs, is that they, they have much nicer optimization landscapes. Um, tune your hyperparameters. I've written this bit in italics because it's sort of true of all neural networks. Change your, change your neural network size, change your learning rate, dot, dot, dot. This is always uh, necessary. And I sort of said for neural networks here, but to be honest, I think this is probably just true of modeling in general. Um, that uh, typically with models, there's, there's a lot of these kind of like arbitrary choices we have to make. Um, and for like magical reasons, some of them work well and some of them don't. Um, and you know you expect to have to change to, to tune these things, um, and the, the software out there that will do that for you. And I, I highly encourage anyone doing this to, to do that using this this this, this, this software for doing so. Also, um, I, uh, this is something like Bayesian optimization and, uh, and techniques like this if you've seen them. Um, initializing neural network before training with very very small weights. Okay, what am I talking about there? What, what I'm saying really is start this learned correction, this neural network near zero. If you recall what I had earlier, I wrote down some theoretical model. And this theoretical model was, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good, actually. Right? And this is the typical starting point, is that we have some pretty good theoretical model. Um, and, and then I want my question to, like, learn some small perturbation to that. So typically, I will have that start near zero, um, it, so that I don't just, like, straight from the get-go, just start in some weird part, uh, like, you know, or some weird model that doesn't overlap my data. Okay, what else? Um, something else I was implicitly doing early on is I told you how I trained my physical models first, and then after that, in all my retrainings, I only ever trained the neural network. This is a very common workflow. Train the physical parts first, have the physical parts capture as much of the physics as they can. Don't let the neural network capture any of the known physics. Let it stick to just the unknown physics. Um, then this is where I return to this, this point I briefly mentioned about uh, how you differentiate your differential equation solver. Um, this is a point which, for those of you who haven't seen this before, please just like ignore it, it doesn't matter. Those of you who have ever heard the term, the adjoint method, um, which I'm guessing is probably like at least a couple of you who've ever seen neural ODs before, or anything like this. Um, this is something where, like there was this one paper a few years ago that used the adjoint method, this, this one particular way of computing gradients through a differential equation solver, uh, and everyone has been using it ever since, um, despite uh, at the same time, everyone who actually does this professionally also knows that this is a terrible approach um, and that this one paper just happened to get very popular using this method. And a lot of people have cultured it forward since then. Um, so those of you who have seen this before, consider this a quick soapbox moment and those of you who haven't, it doesn't matter. Um, try different numerical methods. So once again, tricks of the trade. What are the other things you need to just keep in the back of your head and things you need to try? Um, uh, I sort of said we put this into, my di into a differential equation solver, but 
I didn't really tell you that much beyond that. Like, what kind of numerical method do I use? A more accurate solver with more function evaluations, a less accurate solver with fewer function evaluations. What kind of like step size tolerance do I have? So, so typically that's you know how big a step am I making, or what is the tolerance? What's the error I'm going to make? Um, and you, you can actually trade these things off. So you can balance your training speed. So you balance how fast you evaluate your model. You can balance that off against getting numerically accurate solutions. Um, so there's there's uh, choices you can make here. And so typically, uh, you know, during training, you might use like a less accurate solver um, uh, to, to try and like just get through as much of the training as you possibly can in a fairly short span of time and then tighten it up with, a, with an even better solver just right at the very end um, just to have it properly then uh, fit. Um, I'm using the solver you'd like to use at inference time. Um, okay, so that I think is, yes, this is the end of part one. So summary so far, neural ODEs, they look a lot like mechanistic ODEs. They are really, really similar. Um, in both cases, it's just this parameterized vector field. And in both cases, we just train this by back propagating and performing gradient descent. Um, it just so happened that in the, in the case of a pure mechanistic ODE, I had a bunch of theory telling me that this mechanistic form looks like my data. And in the case of the neural ODE, I have a bunch of theory telling me that neural networks are good at approximating lots of kinds of different data. Um, and so it's, it's just like different theoretical backings for, for these different um, parameterized vector fields. Um, and these easy to implement, this is what I'm going to be speaking about a little bit going forward. Um, it's a, there's the sort of off-the-shelf software for many of these things. Um, one thing I've sort of implicitly done here is start with a known physical model. Um, and then I've put the neural network on the bit that I that I hypothesize isn't well modeled. Um, you know, basically, this is really, really common. Um, the neural network here is tiny. It's a really, really small correction. The physical model really is doing a lot of the work here. And this is really common. Um, I'm not here to tell you not to use the things you already know, right? Keep using all of the tools you already have. Build the best possible model you can without a neural network. Um, and then at the last possible step, come in and add the neural network as that final admission that you've done everything you possibly can. And this is the final thing you're going to do to make it just a little bit better. Um, and then I, I've already emphasized this point here first, right? You know, do the physical bit first. Um, a point on terminology. Uh, we've been saying neural differential equation and neural ODE. Um, if you go to like various parts of different parts of the community, you'll hear all kinds of different words thrown around. Um, these are all basically the same thing. At the end of the day, the, the only really correct one is this down here on, on the bottom right, parameterized ODE, because it's not actually nothing more specific than that. Um, but despite that, if you ever chat to anyone doing Julia, they'll almost always say universal ODE. If you ever chat to me, I'll almost always say neural ODE, but technically we're both of us lying to you. It's, it's, it's this parameterized ODE down here on the bottom right. Um, okay, so uh, software and open problems. So this is where part one, I've been sort of trying to sort of tell you a little bit about modeling. Now part two, I'm speaking to that sort of, you know, grad student in the room who has to sit down and actually do this. Um, what, how, what are the tools you need to do this? Um, well, first of all, we've got a pretty good ecosystem going for doing all this stuff in JAX. So those of you who, who've seen, who haven't seen this before, um, you've probably heard things like TensorFlow and PyTorch and so on, these auto-differentiable computation libraries. Um, so JAX is, is the, the auto-differentiable computation library that we use very, very widely now at Google, just completely ubiquitously. Um, there was TensorFlow back in the day, um, and TensorFlow was basically like, you know, V1, where people were still figuring out a lot of the, the abstractions and the correct ways to do this. And then PyTorch came along and made it even better, and then JAX has come along again and made it better still. Um, so so this, is, this is what we, we all use internally. Um, and here's a very quick example. I'm not going to like, I'm not expecting you to really pass this. I just wanted to throw up some code and sort of, encourage, you know, just sort of give you some window into what this looks like when you work with it in practice, where you say things like my, my, my neural network, this MLP, is, is, is just this thing that initializes an MLP and I can solve my neural OD by calling into this, this differential equation solve function. And then I go ahead and like, you know, I bung all these different arguments together. Again, I'm not expecting you to pass this. I just wanted to give you at least some flavor of, of what this looks like day to day. And so there's this toy example solving a small neural ODE. And the libraries that we're, that we're using here are things like Diffrax. This is for differential equation solving. Uh, Equinox, so this is for, for neural networks. Uh, I've mentioned Jack's typing here. So this is this is giving us type annotations for like the, the shape and d-type of an array. Uh, and then side note, if any of you find yourself using PyTorch or anything like that instead of Jax, then the name is kind of a lie. It actually also supports PyTorch. So um, this this bottom right one here about some, like checking the shape and d-type of an array, this is like really, really very much good practice these days. Almost everyone does this, I found, um, because shape errors in neural network evaluations is just super common. Um, for, for, you know, it's a very common class of bug is what I'm trying to express. Um, so anyone who's done any of this before, uh, I imagine has has bumped into this issue before, and you, you might like this library as, as a solution. Um, okay, 
on software. I've spoken so far about neural differential equations, but also just a quick soapbox moment about software in general. Please write better code. Um, this is something where, as academics, there is this like systemic issue, um, and I'm speaking as an ex-academic myself, right? There's this systemic issue where uh, academics don't write very good code, and it's often buggy, and like, the only reason one bug doesn't sink is because another bug comes along and gets in the way of the first. Um, and so it's really, uh, I really encourage people to just use some of the, like, the current, like, just standard off-the-shelf tools that people use to write. I'm, I'm going to be talking about Python here, on the assumption that most people are using Python. Um, the, the sort of tools people use to write better Python code, this is something like Black for auto-formatting. This is uh, checking for common errors with, with Rush, type checking with PyWrite. Um, you can run these things automatically using stuff like pre-commit. Um, and then if, you know, you, just, you don't want to go to the hassle of actually setting any of this up, please just, like, copy-paste my own config. Um, this is something where I, uh, I really, really encourage this as a way to write much better, less buggy, safer code. Uh, I've seen too many projects fail because, because the code is buggy. Okay. Um, open problems. This is where we now get towards the end of my talk. Um, open, so I've spoken a lot about the things that we can do. What are the things we, we can't do? Um, so neural ODEs, um, just applying existing techniques. Uh, to existing problems in science. This is one really big open problem um, where, you know, like how many papers are published like every day doing some kind of differential equation to some part of science. Um, and, you know, I'm not an you know, ODE maximalist. They won't be useful everywhere, but they will be a useful tool for a great many problems. Um, so it's a tool I'd like people to have in their toolbox um, and, and a tool that I, I'd like, you know, be, I would I'd love to see being applied to more broadly just kind of everything that happens in science. Um, and then more so on now on the theoretical end of things, um, one big open problem actually is neural ODEs for like stiff dynamics, like multi-scale dynamics, um, where it turns out there's like actually not been that much work done on these. So if you're the kind of person who's interested in like, I don't know, like modeling chemical reaction kinetics or something like this with neural ODEs, then there's actually some interesting open problems for you there. And I think some, some you know, probably a lot of papers to be written um, make figuring this one out. Um, I've spoken today entirely about neural ODEs, but of course, in the previous talk, just the general term neural differential equation was used. The word ordinary didn't appear. Um, and this is because, you know, there's a whole gamut of different differential equations out there, right? Um, and so you've got things like CVEs. These are the ones that sort of accept time series as input. Um, and there's a bunch of interesting questions here about how you uh, handle these things efficiently. Um, these have some interesting connections to, to reinforcement learning and control theory for anyone who's got a background in that. Um, neural stochastic differential equations. So in, in machine learning parlance, random is termed generative. And so here, a stochastic differential equation, obviously this is random. And so in machine learning parlance, I would say they are generative. Each time I look at my STE, I, I get a new sample. Every time I look at it again, I get another different sample, right? Um, and, and this actually makes them quite difficult to train stably. So um, interesting open questions there and some connections to if, if anyone's been tracking the machine learning uh, recent successes and over the past few years has seen this, this rise of score-based diffusions, um, there's some obvious connections there to, I think that can be explored. Um, neural PDEs, this is where I particularly touch on the previous talk. Um, neural PDEs are almost entirely unexplored. Um, in large part, this is because ODEs are like ODEs are ODEs are ODEs. They don't really come in that many different flavors. But for PDEs, you know, you've got like elliptic and parabolic and hyperbolic and blah, 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 and all these other kinds of um, partial differential equation. And every one of them seems to need special treatment, right? You know, certainly if you ever chat to a numerical analyst, that's what they'll tell you, that they, they've had to cook up some special scheme to simulate this one differential equation. Um, and as a result of that, uh, there's there's a whole zoo of different partial differential equations. And I think uh, uh, like a lot of just, it's basically just almost completely unexplored for what it means to, to go ahead adding neural networks to these in smart places. Um, so, you know, you might start positing things like neural advection reaction diffusion equation or something like that. Um, uh, which side note, by the way, we've started seeing people use this in the graphics community to, to model functions on manifolds, which I think is kind of cool. Um, and then this actually also has some connections to uh, some um, uh, machine learning applications as well. It turns out these look a lot like these things called mixer architectures. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk. So congratulations, um, you've, you've stuck through me talking for half an hour, uh, and now you know everything there is to know about neural ODEs. Um, so if you want some further links, then first of all, this example that I, I showed you earlier, you know, I did in fact actually simulate this. Um, and if you want the code that I used to simulate this, it's all written in Defax and Equinox and so on. And this is, the, you know, so that is to say, in, in the JAX ecosystem, this is all available here. Um, if you want references for, for this material, um, then uh, I'm sort of pointing you at my thesis here, just as like a convenient textbook on the topic. Uh, I think I think that actually got thrown up at the very end of the previous talk as well, like to, to introduce me. Um, 
And then if you want more on the JAX ecosystem, then you can look at, I'm pointing you at the differential equation solving library here, because I, I assume that's probably a, uh, an interesting starting point for many of you. Um, then this, this has many links within it to the rest of the ecosystem. Um, and then finally, all that remains to say is thank you very much for having me. Um, and I'll take any questions now, or if you want to, message me later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for making us experts uh, in half an hour. That's uh, fantastic. Yeah. I guess there will be questions from the audience. Anyone? Maybe I'll start. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, I was wondering if. Uh, Can you uh, speak a bit louder because you might not hear it. I was wondering if there is any efforts for like uh, using this kind of this line of research for understanding the known physics, like to understand the processes. Because in the slide, it was mentioned that there is no way to to know the, the, the real world using this kind of equation. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, if there is already any effort to go toward that direction or not. Um, so I'm just so I understand the question. You're, you're asking why it's not possible to understand the real world mechanistically. Um, like often it's just well, it's kind of a question. You also mentioned that it's not possible using these uh, neural ODs to understand the known physics, right? So we already know the equation to fit the model. But I'm wondering if we can use this kind of data-driven approaches to understand the processes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think basically what you're what you're asking, if I understand you correctly, is um, let's suppose we, we do this kind of thing. I do a neural differential equation. Um, can I possibly go from that to some mechanistic understanding? Um, yeah. or, or like, is that it? Do I just get a neural network and, and I'm dropped on? Okay. So actually, it's, it's nice that you touched on this uh, because, in fact, I just move forward. Appendix. <laughs> I guess that this question might come up. I have a slide on this. Here we go. Um, so, okay, there's rather a lot going on here. I won't try and talk through all of it, but very, very briefly, um, this this uh, this top right one here. So, if you look at this, this picture up here in the top right. Uh, maybe I'll just emphasize that with that. There you go. This is the thing I actually had earlier. When I said, oh, I, I write this thing down and I, I get some values, these are, in fact, the actual values for those parameters. And then I've got some neural network there with, again, some fixed values of parameters. And so what can I do? I can sort of chase a bunch of details, blah, 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 blah. Um, and basically what it turns out, you can do is this thing called symbolic regression um, to convert your neural network back into a mechanistic um, interpretable form, which in this case looks like this. So here I'm basically, so Y here is essentially indicating this, this, this neural network, if you wish. Um, and, and now I, I have some sense of what this looks like as, as an actual equation. Um, and so, for example, I can look at this and I can tell you something like, oh, this neural network, uh, this, 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 uh, that function here has no dependency on the number of rabbits. So that's telling me something about the mechanistic form. Um, and then, of course, I can, I can also look at this, this form more directly and go, oh, hang on, there's a minus cat term here that cancels out with plus cat term up here. You know, blah, 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 blah. You can, you can start sort of looking at this. Um, and so uh, I would say if you want to know more about this, then blah, 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 blah. this is... Uh, Section 6.1, this one I've emphasized over here. Um, uh, this, is, this is the bit where I, I talk about symbolic regression. Um, and in, indeed, this is, I'd say, probably the best way to, to try and gain some mechanistic understanding from, from a neural network. It's to just, just turn it back into a bunch of symbols. Cool. I hope that helped. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. How is this linked to physics informed neural network spins? <laughs> yeah, you saw that pick up. Pop up, didn't you, in the appendix? Uh, well, right, yeah. go on. Let's let's uh, let's look at that too. <laughs> yeah, here we go. So yeah, neural differential equations versus pins. So pins are this other sort of you know physics-y neural networky kind of thing that people talk about a lot about. Um, what's the distinction? So neural differential equations. This thing I've been talking about today are they're a the modeling approach where I'm saying, here is some model. I'm going to learn the theta in, in here. It's a very, very, I've just sort of written down some generic looking ODE. And I said, I want to try and uh, put some neural network into my model and, and, and learn that to match my data. Um, and my loss function is this thing you've already seen. It's model against data. OK. Pins, meanwhile, are a numerical method. So this is to say, given an ODE, this thing over here on the right-hand side, and that's any ODE at all, um, neural or otherwise, given an ODE, I'm going to try and learn the solution to it, the, the, the find this Y. So you know, up, up here on the top, the NDE, but my, my neural network is part of this F, and down here, for, um, my neural network is, is this way I find Y. And in this case, my loss function is, please satisfy my ODE. 
Um, these two terms, for what it's worth, uh, so they're clearly very different things, right? Um, but these terms, despite having precise meaning, often get muddled up. Um, it's fairly common in a pin literature to also do a neural differential equation at the same time and just call the whole thing a pin. Um, and so that partly because of that, uh, these, these words have often gotten a bit, gotten a bit muddled up. Um, one thing I should also emphasize, uh, of course, that's what, what the, these two loss functions look like when you add them together. Um, one thing that's really worth emphasizing, though, is that pins are mostly a bad idea. Um, this is something where, like, I told you that they're a numerical method. But we also already have lots and lots of very good numerical methods, right? You know, a lot of very smart people spend the past several decades developing some very, very good numerical methods for, for ODE solving and, and, and so forth. Um, and it's really, really tough to beat those existing techniques. So basically what we end up finding is that pins as a numerical method start being useful only really when the traditional numerical methods start failing. So this is when you've got like high dimensional PDEs, these non-local operators, anything like this, um, where you've just got something so completely horrendous that you could not possibly cook up a theoretical approach to numerically solving the, um, the ODE. Um, but at the same time, these are like not that common. They don't come up that often. Um, and so um, pins, I think, get, get far too much press compared to how, how often they actually turn up to be useful in practice. Um, but nonetheless, this, this is this, the, the distinction. Um, I hope that answers it. Any other questions? Yeah, I think there was a question online. Uh, Thomas, can you speak us? Yes, it's possible. I, I was interested. Uh, you uh, really have a high conceptual view between neural networks with machine learning and uh, differential equations. Uh, I didn't uh, expect that uh, until now. Do you also see some relationship and uh, possibility to apply genetic uh, algorithm? Mm. Because the, those are even more complex and more advanced, in my own opinion, at least, than neural networks. Uh, and I know people are working on them. They can model so, more things. Do you know them? OK, so um, first of all, I think you're conflating two slightly different concepts here. So a neural network is a model. Right, but a, gen a genetic algorithm is a way of training; it's an optimization technique. Um, and so, this is something where, uh, in order to train something like, say, a, a neural network or a neural differential equation, you must have a model and a choice of optimization technique, and you put the two together. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if you wanted to, you could train a neural network via genetic algorithms. It's actually what people used to do about 20 years ago or so. Now, before the details of backpropagation got worked out, um, and so this is something which doesn't see a lot of use these days, um, ever since gradient-based methods came online. They're just much, much more efficient. You, you can say they're like provably more sample efficient and stuff like this. Um, but one thing that I can speak to, actually, which is pretty cool, and it's interesting that you brought this up, is if we go back to this symbolic regression slide here, um, where I said, oh, I'm just going to sort of symbolically regress, and I didn't really tell you the details of how I obtained this symbolic expression from my neural network. Um, and it turns out that actually many of the most popular and effective symbolic regression algorithms are genetic algorithms, um, which work by taking some guessed symbolic form and then just guessing random mutations to it and seeing what works. Uh, and it turns out that this is actually a really good way to do it. Um, so so um, uh, genetic algorithms actually do continue to be part of this story um, right here. Cool. I hope that helps. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, um, Felix, do you know how interpretable are these uh, models, these neural differential equations? Because I'm, I'm asking this to understand the, the relation between the parameters of the model and the, uh, the physical variables. So can we abstract uh, physics that is not known from these learned parameters like theta in this uh, the neural network? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically you're trying to understand what that parameter means, because if I write down like one of my lot of Altera examples, right, you can you can look at that and you can understand what alpha is, right? you can understand what beta is, and you're trying to say, can I understand theta in the same way? Um, the answer mostly is no. It's just like uninterpretable neural network magic, right, just happening somewhere inside. Um, and the, my, my standard answer to this, uh, if you want to understand it, is to go back and do all this symbolic regression stuff that I spoke about here at the end. Um, do that, get a symbolic form, and then understand that in the way that you're used to. Yeah, there was one more question. Yeah. So, um, so I understood from your talk that with this neural ODE, what you are doing, you are modeling the error uh, or the noise in your system. So that means you are dealing with the brain, the brain box models, which you know the physics, but you don't know some parameters of it. 
mm -hmm. you have observations and you don't know the, the noise, the, the, the process mm -hmm. noise, and you mm -hmm. want to model it. Mm -hmm. in, in the other framework, which is for uh, yeah, uh, the physics informed deep learning, or before that, uh, well, physics informed deep learning, you, so you model the states, so you parameterize the state of your system based on machine learning technique, could be uh, LSSVM, support vector machines, or uh, neural networks, whatever. So, could you combine these two? Uh, meaning that, so now what you are doing, you are uh, modeling the noise based on neural networks, based on machine learning. Uh, the other one is modeling the state based on uh, machine learning. Could you combine these two and would it be helpful or not? Okay. So, um, first of all, you, you spoke about using the neural network to model the noise. Um, that word often has a very particular meaning, right? Um, I would not say that we're using the neural network in a, in a neural OD to model the noise. We're using it to model unknown physics. Um, and so, like, the, when my when my existing mechanistic model is not perfect, it can be for multiple reasons. It could just be due to noise in the data, or it could be because there's phenomena I don't understand. Typically, it'll, it will be because of both. Um, and, and ideally, when your network captures the unknown physics um, and not so much the noise, uh, you know, if, you, if you're modeling the noise, it's because you're overfitting. That's what overfitting is. Um, the um, you're you're making this question about physics informed deep learning. Um, the I think of that as just a fairly generic term to just refer to any kind of deep learning meets any kind of physics. Um, are you talking about physics informed neural networks in particular, or are you getting at something more specific? I could not understand the last sentence. Um, sorry. So you, you use the term physics informed deep learning. Um, yeah. And to me, that's just this generic term for like any kind of physics meets any kind of deep learning. Yeah. So um, basically, basically, in that framework, you, what you do, you start with as you, you parameterize your state of your mode of your equation mm -hmm. with, with machine learning, uh, you, with neural networks or with whatever model that you choose. And mm -hmm. then you fit it into your, uh, you plug it in into your equations. And then you you minimize uh, yeah the loss function. Okay. okay. So so um, you're referring to pins specifically. Yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. This thing. Yeah. So um, my my question is: Could you combine these pins with neural, mm -hmm. and would it be at that uh, there mm -hmm. is there any advantage on it or or not? And mm -hmm. the, the noise that I refer was more related to uh, process noise, not the error noise. So basically, you are you are modeling the process noise. I think. Okay. So. Um, can you combine these things? Yes, yes, you can. This is just this combined loss function down here at the bottom. Um, uh, is it a good idea? Mm, mostly no. Um, this is something where it's a good idea if you are dealing with a high dimensional partial differential equation or something like this, something where you really do need to fall back to this numerical method of last resort. Um, but if you have literally any other numerical method, then just use that instead. Um, then the I think you, you made this comment that you sort of you couldn't like give different labels like like process noise or, or like sensor noise or anything like this to, to what's going on and, and yes I agree you, you can you can do something like that um, for, for the different pieces that, that that you don't claim to understand. Okay, perfect. I have one more question. So um, in in the neural ODE, so uh, so you are using a, a kind of solver for for simulating the ODE like the Rangiputa or, or something, and these are um, Fixed step size, or could you also use variable step size solvers? Yes, yeah, you, you can use variable step size solvers. Um, so this is something where, when I write down my neural ODEs, um, so you know, anything like this, hopefully you can just about make that out. I think it might be quite small. Um, when when I um, th this is basically just an ODE like any other, um, and so I can just go ahead and use a numerical ODE solver like any other. Um, this is one of these points I try to emphasize: is that the neural part of the ODE here, honestly, it gets far too much attention it's still the ODE part that is telling you almost everything about what's going on in an interesting way. Um, and so, yes, it's it's just standard adaptive step size, I don't know, explicit bunker cutter, you know, so any, um, techniques that, that tend to be used by most people. Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. Last question? Yeah. Well, I was just a bit worried about uh, first fixing the other parameters, because the, the other parameters can be influenced, of course, by what you put into the neural network for you. There's something going on there that's not in the first model. So, mm -hmm. yeah, how do you fix that? 
Yeah, so this sort of depends basically how many steps you want to take. Um, a very, very common approach to this is start off with just the theoretical thing, fit just the theoretical thing, get that to sort of model as much of the physics as you can. Add in the neural network, have that model as much of the unknown physics as you possibly can. And then if you wanted to, so, you know, so like I trained just one piece and then I trained just the other piece. And if I wanted to, I could then consider this joint thing and train them both at the same time um, to try and do slightly better again so that my, my neural network and my, my physics can sort of like try and like co-optimize together. Um, or indeed, perhaps you, you do what I've just said and then you do symbolic regression on your neural network, get the whole thing into a mechanistic form and then completely retrain that from, from that form. Um, and that will typically give you even better estimates of your, of your mechanistic parameters. Um, so, so yes, there's absolutely um, like sort of slightly more complicated variations you can do there to try and really capture as much of the physics as you can. Okay, it's four to six here and four to nine for you. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming so early out of bed and uh, you know giving us this fantastic lecture. I hope and I trust it will stimulate actually you know more exploration of neural differential equations in our different fields, hopefully also in complex systems. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're going to eat pizza. You probably go for coffee. <laughs> and uh, so thanks for being here and uh, good luck with Google X also in your new uh, job. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me.